I want to get started on the analysis of variance um, portion of the class. Um, we're going to talk about assignment five, and then analysis of variance and analysis of covariance. In this particular um, lecture, we're just going to touch the surface on analysis of variance, and we'll talk about assignment five. So assignment five is due on the Sunday the 5th, and uh, it's asking you to do a two-way ANOVA. So that would be two independent variables, and we'll talk you know, more about some of those details as we move forward. And then you're going to examine the simple effects regardless of whether they're significant or not. Normally, if they're not significant, we wouldn't examine the simple effects. But we want to do that here just as a, an exercise, and so we'll we'll get into those details uh, in the next video that I'll do. Uh, and then, of course, three and four are um, typical of what uh, you've seen in the homeworks. Annotate the output, and then write the results. And then I ask you to include a few uh, additional additional details. So let's get started with um, the slides. So uh, analysis of variance, or ANOVA, is used to test the differences, or test for differences among two or more groups. A one-way ANOVA would indicate that we have a single independent variable that defines group membership. Oftentimes when we're talking about analysis of variance, we would refer to that as a factor. Uh, so a single factor uh, ANOVA would be a single independent variable ANOVA. Likewise, a two-way ANOVA has two independent variables that define group membership. And then an N-way ANOVA would be N independent variables. Um, and we, we, usually, we usually stop, um, you know, three is probably a lot of independent variables for analysis of variance. Um, if I can get this to work here. Um, we usually stop at um, we usually stop. Sorry, we usually stop. Um, so when we're talking about um, the um, number of independent variables, two is probably most typical or typical. Every once in a while, you'll see somebody that has three independent variables. I don't know, four is, is just gets unruly. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, interpreting four-way interactions isn't anybody's expertise. And so it's usually one way or two way. Two way is more common than I think a single factor ANOVA, but, um, but three, uh, uh, much less so common and four uh, almost uh, never see. So it might seem reasonable to use multiple t-tests if you wanted to, to compare a variable for more than two groups. So let's say we had uh, uh, three groups, and so we had you know, a group one, group two, and group three. It might seem reasonable. Well, let's just do one t-test between groups one and two. We'll do another t-test between groups two and three. And then we just need to do a third t-test between uh, groups one and three. And so we could just, you know, that might seem like uh, a reasonable approach just to do those three t-tests instead of ANOVA. Um, but performing those tests compared to using a, an analysis of variance procedure is going to increase the probability of making a type one error. And so the question is, is, how much does it change that probability? And this is just useful. Uh, you, these are just useful calculations to have uh, to, um, uh, uh, none of them are very complicated, but just useful to have and to uh, be able to think and articulate why analysis of variance isn't um, isn't or is the best approach in, in, in many case in many cases. So the number of possible pairwise comparisons would be equal to, and we talked about this in class when we were talking about correlations a few weeks back, is equal to k minus k minus one, where k is the number of groups that make up the variable. So in the example that we just looked at where we had 
um, k was equal to 3, it would be 3 times 2, 6, uh, divided by 2, which is 3, which is exactly the number of comparisons, exactly the number of comparisons that I had. And so that's the first, how many pairwise comparisons would you have to do if you, um, if you did t-test, it would be k times k minus 1 divided by 2. So let's say we had five groups. Uh, so it would be 5 times 4 divided by 2, which would be 10. And so that means if we, that means we'd have to do 10 uh, different comparisons. So if we had a um, five-group example, and if we, I'm not going to do all 10 of them, but that would be one, that would be two, that would be three, that would be four, five, six, and there'd be there'd be ten total uh, um, pairwise comparisons that that you could that you could make there. Um, the um, the um, inflation to the air rate is equal to one minus. 1 minus alpha raised to the c power, where c is the number of comparisons that are being made. And, um, and so I have an example on the next slide that, that is actually uh, looking at um, 5, uh, if we had an analysis of variance with 5 groups, and, and so we'll be able to see that. When um, group comparisons are done under ANOVA, we can make some adjustment for the multiple comparisons so we can keep our type 1 error rate at, at something reasonable. Um, and so here's an example where the number of groups is equal to 5. So we have 5 uh, uh, times 4 divided by 2 is 10 comparisons, and that's the... Uh, uh, the um, same as I gave you just a minute ago, and then to calculate well, what will our what will our actual type one error rate be if I did those ten comparisons? Well, your type one error rate would be um, about forty percent is the actual probability. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be 0 0.05 because this is if you set your alpha at 0.05. Um, it would not be it would not be that um, because you're making you're making ten comparisons and, and and that has to be taken into account when we um, when we um, um, do those multiple comparisons and so the math is pretty straightforward you might have to find um, a, a place in your calculator where you can raise uh, something to the tenth power but it's essentially take 0.95 raise it to the 10 power, and then 1 minus that quantity is going to get you 0.4. So uh, try an example. Uh, say we had six groups, and see what you get for the um, actual probability, uh, if, if you want to. Um, and so hopefully that makes sense. And if it doesn't, um, please send me a note, and I'll be happy to, to, to um, review it with you. But the key here is that we are probably we should be reluctant to make the um, multiple comparisons with t tests because it's going to increase the likelihood of making a type one error rate, and so hopefully that there seems uh, intuitive to to all of you and. Um, and uh, that's the whole reason why we're, or that's one of the reasons why we're, we're doing analysis of variance. And so to talk just a little bit, and this will be the last slide that we'll cover here, to talk just a little bit about the assumptions, the level of measurement of the independent variable can be anything that identifies groups. And so it, it has to be either nominal or uh, some dichotomy which most dichotomies are nominal as well. So if we're talking about male-female dichotomy, that would be, that would be a, a nominal level of measurement. And so um, just make certain that, um, that you are not using a continuous, unlike we did with regression, where we had to have 
continuous independent variables. Make sure you're not using continuous independent variables for the independent variables when we do ANOVA. So you'll have to find something that defines, that's, that's nominal, that defines group membership and, and some, con a continuous variable doesn't do that. Um, the level of measurement for the dependent variable is, however, uh, interval level measurement. Um, the dependent variable needs to be normally distributed. And we'll talk about this some. The variances uh, of the groups need to be somewhat equal. And we talked about this with uh, early on in the semester. We talked about Levine's test when we looked at, um, we did some t-tests when we were testing for missing data. And we spent a little bit of time talking about Levine's test and what it's testing. And this is this is this is Levine's test. Um, that, that that's how we test that assumption. So so uh, really nothing new there. And then the the final assumption is that our observations are independent. And so remember that this is just the idea that um, that that um, the the example that I always refer to is that that I think best demonstrates what independence of observation is is if we flip a coin um, uh, the the second flip of the coin whether we get a heads or tails is not at all in any way connected to the first flip that we did and the third flip is not at all connected to the first or the second flip that we did those observations, those flips that we're doing of the coin are utterly independent of each other. They're not connected. What I get on the first will has no bearing of what I'm going to get on the second, assuming we have a fair uh, coin. Um, and so that's what, that's what independence of observation signals here as well, is that the, that the, the F table that we use is, is based on the idea that observations are independent, that they're not connected. Uh, and so uh, snowball sampling is the uh, example that, uh, that we've um, talked about as well, where, and, and that would be a, a violation of independence of observation because uh, it, with the snowball sample, uh, you, you contact a person, that person gives you some data potentially, and then that person refers you to a second person. And then that second person refers you to a third person. And that third person potentially refers you to a fourth person. And that's, that is, um, that is a, a, a pretty substantial violation of independence of observation because those individuals are all connected uh, in, in, um, in that... Um, uh, connected in that they, they, there's a, there's a clear um, chain or that happens from the first person to the second person and then that chains from the second person to the third person and from the third person to the fourth person. And so that idea of a snowball sample would be would, would be a violation. And, and so one just has to use good judgment when, uh, uh, collecting data using uh, um, analysis of variance or any of the other statistics that we've talked about in this class. And, um, you know, I've, I've had students ask the question, well, aren't we all dependent in some way? We're all students at the University of Oklahoma or we're all um, members of the Norman community or many of us are members of the Norman community so we're, we're all you know inhabitants of uh, planet earth and so where do we draw the lines and we just need to use uh, good judgment and and avoid the the obvious uh, violations or the most obvious and so uh, those are the um, uh, five assumptions of analysis of variance uh, starting next week, we'll talk just a little bit about um, uh, the some of the math, and you can scroll forward a couple of slides if you want to, but there's not a whole lot there.
and then we'll dive into um, uh, looking at results and 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 uh, interpreting those results and understanding how we do post hoc tests and then understanding what simple what simple effects are and what interactions are. So um, again, if you have questions, uh, please let me know.